Would you all please stand and sing with us again? We are singing a song that we introduced a couple weeks ago. Uh, but please sing with us if you know it. If not, listen to the words and have to be a reflection of your heart this morning. Thank you for joining us. Uh, our worship teams regularly pray that we would decrease and that Christ would be lifted up, that this wouldn't be about us, that this would be about Jesus. And this morning, the Lord has answered our prayers by not giving us any stage lights. Uh, we, so if you're wondering what's going on with that, uh, we don't know. Or at least I don't know, but they're not working right now. So bear with us as... Uh, as we deal with that. But of course, again, it isn't about us. This is about Jesus this morning. So we're excited to worship with him nonetheless. Um, we're also excited about coming back this evening. We have a church picnic planned and the Lord has sought to it that we would probably have some rain this afternoon. So we're going to do that here. Uh, and so if you're coming to the picnic, just come here. Uh, there is a dessert contest. So if you'd like to join that, Bring the desserts here. There's four different categories. Uh, don't stress about it. it. Make a dessert. It will get into one of the categories. I think there's an other category. Um, so that's obviously probably a pretty broad scope there. But let me encourage you to, to participate with that. If you'd like to be a judge, I don't know how you become a judge. you got to talk to Amy and Ron Trosel. Uh, they, they will be able to, to help you out with that. Uh, but we're looking forward to, uh, to being together this afternoon, this evening. This is 4 to 8. Uh, come, we're going to be in the gym. If it's raining, we'll, we'll have some stuff to do in there. And uh, looking forward to just being together as a church family. We're going to sing some songs together. Uh, pastor's going to just share a quick Devo, and we're looking forward to doing that. So let me encourage you to come to that. Along with that, we're going to need some help right after the service. 
to set up some chairs and tables. So if you're able and have a few moments, uh, I think we can, we can get that squared away pretty quickly. So if you're able to, just meet in the gym. We'll set up some chairs and tables for that and uh, be able to get that ready to go real quickly. Um, why don't we be praying for, uh, we're going to be praying in a minute. We won't do this right away, but just keep in mind, uh, Deb Vogel, her, her mom has been diagnosed um, with, with a pretty serious health condition and um, don't have all the details on that, but just want to be praying for Deb uh, uh, this morning as we think through that. Uh, every month we're trying to do a ministry highlight. And uh, this month, our ministry highlight is the ministry of Center Shot. And I'm still searching, but Dennis uh, Hamora, oh, he's right there. <laughs> In a red shirt. How did I miss this? Uh, Dennis is one of our leaders for, uh, for Center Shot. He's going to explain kind of what the ministry is and how we can pray best for you guys. All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, so recently, Pastor talked about Proverbs 28, verses 18 and 19. It says, like a man who throws firebrands, arrows, and death is the man who deceives his neighbor and says, I am only joking. Now, I know that the main lesson of that verse is pranks and jokes on other people can be hurtful. But it also tells us that uh, throwing flaming arrows in random directions can be dangerous. Uh, at Center Shot, we teach safety and how to safely enjoy archery, and we don't set any uh, arrows on fire. <laughs> so um, for those of you who don't know much about Center Shot, um, Center Shot is similar to a program called NASP. And NASP means National Archery in the Schools Program. NASP was started in 2002 in Kentucky, and it is taught in schools during school hours, and they provide um, the equipment so that it's accessible to all students. NASP likes to say that archery is one of the safest sports, and the only sport safer is table tennis. Now, recently, I taught in Ignite, and uh, Glennis can attest to the fact that some of our teens have brought the danger level of table tennis to a new level. <laughs> <coughs> but nevertheless, uh, Center Shot teaches archery with the same materials and techniques as NASP, except that Center Shot is set up as a ministry of the local church. And instructors are trained and certified with the same materials used by NASP. The mission for Center Shot Ministries is to help pro to provide the local church with a tool that will help evangelize, disciple, mentor, and grow its church family. Mm, so the overall, the Center Shot Ministries is really for a broad variety of ages. Um, but here at uh, FBC Troy, um, our, our center shop program is mainly focused towards the young people. We accept archers who are between second grade and their senior year of high school. And we have three sessions in the fall, winter, and spring. And uh, we meet from 6.30 to 8 p.m. on Monday nights. And each session is nine weeks long, eight weeks of instruction in archery and Bible lessons and a final week as a local tournament. During each evening of instruction, we have a time of Bible lesson, a time of archery instruction, and a time to practice shooting at our indoor range. In the spring, we have plans to take archers to the national tournament held in Louisville, Kentucky, and that's where NASP and Center Shot hold their national tournaments. So what can you do with regard to our Center Shot program? First of all, you can pray for us. Pray for the leaders to have wisdom and pray for the archers that we just have fun, we, we stay safe, and we stay open to the word. Um, if you have any potential archers, uh, let us know. I, th I hear that for our fall session we may be full at this time, but we can talk about it, we can figure out if there's an opening. And it really helps if you can kind of stay the whole time. And so, you know, maybe we can have time to to let new archers in in the, in the winter. Um, and if you're interested in helping out as a leader, come talk to us. Um, we have a limited number of leaders, and as people go out for vacations or business or whatever, you know, we, we need subs. And anybody who's over the age of 18 can help. Um, I recommend, personally, that you come out, you try it for a few weeks, see if that's a ministry that you want to serve in, and then we can look at um, training you uh, as a basic archery instructor. And I hold trainings regularly, once, at least once a year, maybe, depending on who's um, interested. Um, but I can train you and certify you under the Center Shot training program. Thank you.
Thank you, Dennis. And um, yeah, it's a pretty exciting ministry. There's a lot of community folks uh, that we don't see here on Sundays that are here Monday nights. It's a great opportunity for us to share the gospel with these kids and, uh, and a great way to, uh, to have a productive um, and uh, great extra extracurricular activity as well. So be praying about that ministry. Uh, today is September 11th, and, uh, and we want to continually remember um, this, this moment, not to continually grieve, but to continually uh, rest in God's goodness and his faithfulness, even in the midst of trial. So we just go ahead and take a look at this video here as we prepare our hearts. can all remain seated for a little bit. I'm going to be reading um, from Scripture. There's a word, though, that I'm going to preface this with. I, I say, and a lot of times we don't really know what it means. And in fact, it's actually kind of funny because the meaning's a little nebulous, uh, but to the best of our knowledge, it means stop and listen. That word is selah. Um, it happens a lot in the Psalms. So if you could put Psalms 46 up on the screen and read this along with me, um, keeping that in mind what that word means to do. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Selah. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. As we reflect on 9-11, I know a lot of us here, especially in this front row and sprinkled throughout, weren't even alive at the time. But for many of us who were, we remember that hoping and that despair that we had during that tragic time. But for those who were paying attention, we also saw the unity that followed, the random strangers helping out other strangers. But what's most beautiful of all is we saw God working in the lives of our nation and, of, and in us as individuals. So while, we, while we've seen this play its course in, in our history, uh, we've seen nations and kingdoms rise and totter and fall um, and hard times come and go. God has remained steadfast through all of it. And he is still there to bring hope and offer salvation to us. It's kind of funny because a couple verses later, we have a verse that most of us really, really know. 
and it brings that phrase, be still and know that I am God. In the midst of the struggles, in the midst of suffering, we can still take time, pause, and reflect and see God working throughout all of it. We can still look to him for hope and salvation because he is our fortress. So let us take time together to remember who he is. Let's remember what he's done for us and praise him for what he continues to do in the lives of those around us. Please stand and sing.
today, that with every breath that we're able, that we would sing of the goodness of God. We, we are so unworthy. You are so gracious, so loving, and so kind, and, and the kindness of God has led us to, to repentance. And I pray that, that that would be true for anyone here today who would be searching or listening and watching online, that, that your kindness would draw them to repentance and faith. And Father, we, we are humbled by your grace. We thank you, Father, as, as we think of, of uh, that which took place 21 years ago on 9-11, that uh, your grace was evident and you, have, you brought us through. And, and Father, I pray that, that we would live in light of that grace even here today and that uh, we would take comfort in the fact that you are in control of all things, that we can look to you during the times just like that, but whether we have another 9-11 in our own lives, whatever we may be going through that, that is tragic or difficult, thank you, Father, that we can look to you and trust you and, and believe that you are, you are faithful, that you're in control, and that you love and care. So we thank you for these truths, and, and may our hearts be drawn to you through our time together. In your word this morning, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I'd like everybody to um, just raise your hands. Can you do that? Just, I was hoping that many, man's, many hands would make light work, but uh, <laughs> anyway, um, that, that may happen before we're done, but uh, thank you for your patience and your understanding. They're working diligently on that even right now. And uh, so, uh, looking forward to a great time this afternoon, a church picnic. If you say, well, I, I just don't know many people, I don't know, you feel like you're crashing a party, no, that's, we want you here. That's a great way to get to know other folks and, and to uh, encourage you to, to be a part of our fellowship. So, we invite you back and, uh, and, and enjoy that time together. Yes, we, we were hoping it would be at the park and have lots of elbow room. But uh, come th th this evening, probably come in door number seven in the back. Uh, we'll have door number one open as well. But, but door, door number seven takes you right by the gym. And uh, we'll enjoy a fellowship there. and Just to have a lot of fun and fellowship together and great food. So uh, make sure that you uh, make that, put that on your schedule for the day today. While I was pastoring in Fort Wayne, we had a preschool at our church. Had three and four-year-olds, and 
And uh, the three-year-old class would make a booklet throughout the year for their parents. And they drew pictures and the teachers would ask various questions and the teachers would write down the answers for the children. And then they would present this booklet to their moms and dads uh, on the promotion uh, ceremony uh, that, that evening. And two of the questions that they asked were, who is God and what is he like? Some of the answers included... God is the principal. Uh, God is the guy who lives next door. Oh, that's quite a compliment, isn't it? <laughs> uh, he helps me play t-ball. He helps me pick up toys and play trucks. God has a beard, wears a robe, dresses like dad, and wears pants and shorts. <laughs> well, you know, we laugh. And... Uh, but as we laugh at that, we, we understand that we, we know that a right understanding of who God is and how he works is essential to living life and even facing the challenges of life. Aren't you glad that on 9-11 that, that we had our faith and trust in God? And maybe God used that to draw you unto himself. And, and many did come to the Lord through that tragic time. Well, this fall, Lord willing, our series is entitled, our God who is. It's a series on the doctrine of God. And it's essential to gain a biblical, a biblically accurate view of God so as to worship him appropriately, think biblically, speak lovingly, and live faithfully to his honor and glory. So, what do you know about God? You know, we laugh at the preschoolers but I think there are many people, and maybe some in here, who have a, a, an unbiblical view of God. Uh, one unbiblical view is to think that God is just this cosmic killjoy. You know, he just kind of wants to raid on our parade. And if we step out of line, you know, you've had it. You're done. This party's over. Some people have that view of God. Uh, some, on the other hand, think that he's this ethereal grandfather. You know, he sits in a big rocking chair on a big fluffy cloud in the sky. And uh, he has a big, long, white beard. Kind of looks like Santa Claus, you know. And, and uh, he, 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 he wouldn't hurt a flea, let alone judge someone's sin. There may be some who have that view of God. Some think of God as just, he's the divine deliverer. He's, he's the... The, the author of the great fire escape, <laughs> you know, just we, we cry out to him to get us out of hell and, and uh, whatever that hell may look like and thank you, God, and I'm just going to live my life. So that when you get into the foxholes of life, you cry out to God and, and uh, everything's great for a time, right? Until the next crisis comes along, and then you have to cry out to God again. Many did that during 9-11, right? It was a, there was a time when people in our, in our nation cried out to God, and rightly so. In fact, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in our time together at the picnic this afternoon. But looking at, looking at God as, as, the, the, as the, the divine deliverer. But God is so much more than these. These unbiblical ideas. So... So what we need to do is we need to go to the Word of God. The Bible is God's Word to us. Find out what God says about himself. We don't go to the opinions, opinions of the world or the philosophies of the world or, or anybody else's ideas about who God is. We have to go to his Word. The Bible is God's revelation about himself. Now, I, I know and I understand it in order to believe what the Bible says about God, you need to believe that the Bible is the authoritative word of God. And, and so we're, we're looking, okay, we're going to study who God is, and we're going to go to the Bible to find out about that, but what if you don't believe the Bible? Well, that, that's another study in itself, right? And you might be thinking, well, how are you going to deal with that, Pastor? Well, no matter who you are or what you believe, you have an unprovable presupposition or an unprovable starting point as the basis for your personal belief, whether it's the Big Bang or whether 
It's in the beginning God. You might say, well, this guy is delusional. No, I'm not delusional this morning. I'm convinced. And I want to tell you about how I am convinced and why. Everyone starts with that unprovable starting point. You can't prove it. You weren't there. It's a matter of faith. And I choose to believe in the beginning God because there's supporting evidence that exceeds any evidence to any other way of thinking. And based on evaluating that which is reasonable, I choose to begin with two presuppositions. The first one is God is. And that's our take-home thought this morning. God is. And he has spoken. The second one is he has spoken through his word. God is, and he has spoken through his word, the Bible. You can't prove that the Bible is true. You accept it by faith. There are evidences, I believe, that help us understand that, but you have to accept that the Bible is true. And it's all sufficient to tell us everything that we need to know about God. If your starting point is wrong, then your whole belief system is going to be wrong. That's important to know. If your starting point is wrong, your whole belief system is, is wrong. It will be wrong. And, and some of this here this morning is, is a, a very important to our students. Um, elementary, high school, college students, because you're, you're going to get into some situations in the days ahead where you're going to hear uh, a teacher who's very articulate, knows what they're talking about, they, you know, they, they really, and they talk very well, or a college professor, and they're going to look at you and they're going to laugh at you because you believe what the Bible says. So yeah, this is really important stuff. That statement, if your starting point is wrong, your whole belief system will be wrong, is important to understand. You either start with God or you start with man. And man is the idol of 2022 in our culture. Man is everything. People think that man has everything figured out, and we're here to tell you they don't, right? All you have to do is look over the last two, two and a half years, and things were, you know, everybody had opinions about all kinds of things and, and, and with COVID-19 and all of that and what we should do and what we shouldn't do, and, and it was just like chaos, right? And we, we think we have all the answers, and we don't. I, I think that was a time where we realized, you know what? There is a God and we are not him, right? Everyone has a bias and your bias determines what you do with any evidence which, with which you are presented. For example, if a scientist who's an atheist says that no God exists, so when he's presented with evidence, he can never, apart from a changed heart, come to the conclusion that all was created by God. Because he's already professed that he doesn't believe in God, and so there, therefore his conclusions about the evidence are biased. It's been said we don't live by the facts, but we live by the, our interpretation of facts. So, for example, when a, an atheistic scientist looks at the Grand Canyon, he concludes a little bit of water over a long period of time. The atheistic scientist says, you know what? We have time and chance. That, that's the basis of, of their belief system. A little bit of water over a long, 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 long period of time. If you can't figure it out, just add more time to it. Right? And that's the basis of, of their belief. Whereas when... A believer looks at the evidence of the Grand Canyon. We might say, no, oh, no, 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 not a little bit of water over a long period of time. A whole lot of water over a short period of time. I call that the great flush. <laughs> you know, that's, that's it consistent with the, the biblical account of the Genesis flood. A whole bunch of water flushing away over a short period of time. And so it, you have, you have a, a evidence that is before us, but you have different conclusions because of one's bias. 
So, take home thought, God exists. And I believe that there are certain compelling evidences to convince us of this truth, that God exists. We're going to talk about four of those here today. And if you believe that God exists, you understand you are accountable to him. Accountability is why many reject the truth of a biblical God. Accountability is why many reject the truth of a biblical God. Because if, if there is someone out there that created you, you are accountable to that creator. And I think there are a lot of people out there who say, I don't believe in God because I don't want him telling me how to live or what to do. And if they acknowledge that he exists, then they are accountable to him. Now, for those of you who believe, you're going to listen to this this morning. You're going to go, yes, this is good. I need this. Or, wow, I hadn't really thought about it that way before. Or maybe you have, and you're like, I, I pray that this will bolster your faith, that, that these truths will encourage you, that they will, they will give you confidence in your faith. And, and it may be things that you've already heard and you already know, you already believe, but, but as you listen to these, just like, yes, okay, Thank you. We need that. Now, if you're here this morning and you're, you don't believe or you're skeptical, I'm asking you to live, uh, to, to listen with an open mind and just say, okay, let's, let's examine this in light of what God says about all of this. Now, if you don't believe, Romans chapter 1 says, what can be known about God is plain to them Romans chapter 1, verse 19. You can look that up if you'd like or jot that down in your notes. What can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his, listen, his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. This passage points us to the fact that what can be known about God is plain to mankind. God has made it plain. How has he made it plain? Through his creation. And because of that, we're without excuse. We'll get to that in just a few minutes. You know, it's interesting that men and women in the deepest, darkest recesses of the most remote jungle when, you, when, peop, when, when they are discovered, you go to those, those individuals and they are worshiping something or someone. Really? How is that? Why is that? Well, because we were created to worship. Now you say, well, the atheists and they say, I don't worship anything. Well, it, it push comes to shove. They're worshiping themselves or mankind or opinions. We were created to worship. We're all worshiping something or someone. This passage tells us that we suppress the truth by our unrighteousness. Verse 9, excuse me, verse 18. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. We don't like what we're hearing about God and so we suppress the truth about God apart from salvation through Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so we're going to look at these evidences here, the testimonies that establish the existence of God. And the first one is, as you might guess, the Bible. In Genesis 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. And, and you might say, well, in the beginning of what? In the beginning of the time-space environment. This will blow your mind, okay? <clears throat> God created time and space. God is not confined to a time-space environment. We, that's hard for us to comprehend. We, we, we think of things in time and mostly linear time. We have a birth and our lives go on. But God's not confined to that. He's not confined to time and space. He created time and space. And again, 
God has established this fact in his word. The fact that God exists is the foundational truth of the Bible and life. This is essential to living life. If you get this wrong, your belief system will be wrong. And what's interesting is the Bible doesn't set out to prove this. God, the Bible doesn't say, now, you know, way, way back there, there was this, this, this being that was God. And Now, let me explain. It, it, it just establishes that as a fact. In the beginning, God. Doesn't try to prove it. It's, it, it states it as a fact, an established fact. In fact, I, I thought about standing up this morning and just saying, open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God. Let's close in prayer. And some of you would have said, amen. <laughs> there are other evidences that support this presupposition, this starting point that I'm uh, espousing here today. But the Bible just simply states it as true. God's not just mere concept. He's not a fabrication of man's way of thinking to give him a crutch to get through the difficulties of life. He's not, just, he's not this fabricated catharsis to, to just make us feel better about things. No. God is a being who created. It's not a belief that you give casual assent to. I talk to people, and maybe you have too. Oh, I believe in God, as if, <laughs> you know, but doesn't really impact life. Well, James tells us that even the demons believe in what they shudder, right? Believing that there's a God should have an impact on the way that you live. Why? Because you're accountable to him. It's a truth that impacts life. If you don't, if you don't, if, if you have that kind of an attitude, like, oh, yeah, I believe in God, but, you know, I'm just going to move on. That would be like saying, I believe in food, but who needs it? Right? Uh, think the anorexic. Right? If, if you believe in food, but you don't need it, or you don't want it, or just, just a bare, 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 bare minimum about that, the results are emaciation and ultimately devastation and death. So don't have this just casual, I believe in God, but understand that the belief in God is essential to living life and to life itself. It's a truth that you accept by faith. I, I choose to start with the Bible as evidence that God exists and believing that he exists is an, a matter of faith. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you struggle with your faith about this truth or any other truth about, about God and salvation and living life, get into the word. God's word is living, it's powerful, and it gets into our hearts. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists. You say, why are we talking about this here this morning, Pastor? Well, sometime or another, we need to establish the fact that God exists. We need to come back to that. <clears throat> and that he rewards those who seek him. Obviously, you can't draw near to something that doesn't exist. So whenever you discuss the existence of God, you have to, at some time, go to the scriptures. It is in the scriptures that you see God. Now, again, this is something that, that our, our children and our youth and, and uh, uh, college students, and we all need to understand that when you start talking about God and the Bible and even creation, don't allow you to be argued into setting the Bible aside. Because if you start saying something like I started out this morning, in the beginning, God, they'll say, wait, wait, oh, no, 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 don't, don't. You can't do that. I don't believe in the Bible. 
If you say, well, okay, I'll, I'll try another avenue of argument, you've lost the argument. So don't give up on the Bible. It's essential to hold to the truths of the Bible. The Bible is the most scrutinized book that has ever been written. It stood the test of that scrutiny, has outlasted time and eternity, and people will say, well, I just don't believe that. You need to set it aside. I don't want to talk about that. I say, well, we have to talk about it because that's the basis of our faith. And you might even turn around and say, and what's the basis of your faith? And they may say something like, well, uh, you know, I believe in science. Or I, I believe in what my professor told me or what I read in a book somewhere. What book? You know, you have such a firm foundation when you talk about the word of God that they don't have. This is, this is truth, capital T truth, as you go to the word of God. So don't argue God apart from the Bible. These are the very words of the living God. And Hebrews 4.12 once again says that the word of God is living. It's active. It's powerful. Sharper than any two-edged sword. You bring people back to the word of God and God can use that to pierce into their very soul. The word of God establishes the fact that God exists. Here's another testimony. And that's creation. We've been dancing around this here. But it, Genesis 1.1 again says, In the beginning, God created. The Bible simply states it as true that God, the God who is there, the God who is, that God is in existence, and the proof of that existence is his creation. Take your Bibles, turn to Psalm 19. This is a powerful passage that speaks to what we call the the general revelation of God. Verses 1 through 6. We're going to look at verses 1 through 4. But, but this is the general revelation of, of God. In other words, you look at creation. Getting a little ahead of myself here. But if you look at creation, there are some things that you can know about God as he is revealed in his creation. And here you have it. Gen, uh, Psalm 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens are the, the visible arch in which the earth moves. You have three heavens. You have, you have the firmament, which is the, the air that we breathe, our atmosphere. Look, look up. Sometimes it's referred to as the heavens. The second heaven would be the, the sun, the moon, and the stars. That's beyond that. The third heaven is where we talk about where God is. All right? So the heavens, the visible arch in which God moves, declare the glory of God. The word declare here is very interesting. It's, it's a tally mark. <laughs> the heavens are one tally mark as to declaring the glory of God. He's talking about creation. The, the heavens, his creation, is one indication, just one, but it's a tally mark as to that points to the glory of God. And the sky above, it goes on to say, which is a synonym to the heavens, the expanse of the sky, the sky above proclaims his handiwork. The, the idea of handiwork is that there's an activity that produces his creation. The activity of his creation produces what you see. And day to day pours out speech Night to night reveals knowledge. Day and night reveal truths about God and his creation. We were at the, the church softball game the other night. By the way, better luck next year, right? Anyway, um, I was looking over my shoulder back to the east, and I just happened to glance back there, and I'll tell you, the moon was like this coming up out of the eastern sky. And it was like, oh, my, thank you, God. It was just awesome. The heavens declare the glory of God. It was just awesome. And you know what? It was right on schedule. In fact, they told us what time the moon was going to come up. <laughs> 
you know, that's not by accident or chance. God established it. There, verse 3, there is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. His revelation of himself through creation is evident to all. I don't care what language you spoke, what tribe, what nation. Were, were. You looked and you saw that moon off in the east, and it was like, whoa. I, I defy anyone to say anything less than, whoa, <laughs> you know. It, it pointed to the glory of God. Amen. And their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has sent a te set a tent for the sun. Creation itself gives indication that God exists. Personally, I don't understand how anyone can deny the fact at least of intelligent design. To believe that evolution is illogical. It's, it's like believing that a computer can be formed as a result of a tornado ripping through a junkyard. <laughs> you know, just look at creation around you. What makes more logical sense? That there was intelligence behind crea the creation of a flower or an ape or man? That it, or that it just... If there was intelligence behind that or that it just happened by chance over billions and billions of years. The evolutionists laugh at us for believing in creation. We ought to be the, one who are, the ones who are in stitches, right? Like, really? You're going you're gonna to believe that, 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 that this earth and all that there is in it and this universe just happened by time and chance? Really? Hey, to me, you look, at, you look at an eyeball or you look out through an eyeball, right? And you think, how in the world could, could time and chance get that, ever get that right? I, I've talked to a, a hand surgeon years ago and, and he said just the, just the fact of the hand, the human hand is evidence of a creator. To think of all that you can do with that hand is an amazing. And, and having, the, what do they call it, the opposable thumb? Is that what? He said the thumb is so important to the human hand that when he would operate, if someone had their thumb, was without a thumb or got cut off or lost it for some reason or another, they would take the pinky and put it underneath the skin and put it, you know, place it where the thumb was. That's how important the thumb is. That just happened by chance? He's like, there's no way. You, you think of this whole, the, the whole um, uh, right to life debate and, and uh, the abortion and, and all that. It's like, you know, the, the evidence, there is evidence. There, there's one, one picture I saw. There is evidence that there is a God. It's a baby in a womb. Creation. I think science substantiates the existence of God. It's, it's obvious that creation is created by intelligence. And, and I don't believe evolution is science. Science deals with that which is observable in the present. And there's, there was no one there to observe the evolutionary process. There, there was no one there to, to say, yep, now, there was a big bang and... And we can record that and see that, and there, there wasn't any there. Now, when you believe in creation, on the other hand, we do have an eyewitness. In fact, we have, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, a matter is established, right? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who records in the beginning God created. He was there. He was witness to these events, and he recorded it as it happened in his word. I tell you, you don't have to argue about that. He stated it as true. We accept it by faith because of what God has said here in his word. Ken Ham says, what we see in God's wor world agrees with what we read in God's word. To believe that all of this came about by chance, is like looking at this building and saying, 
you know, this just happened as a result of a windstorm. We, we look at this building and we say, you know, no, someone, someone planned this and someone designed this, someone built this. I mean, we, we, we accept that for everything else, the chair that you're sitting in. Someone planned it, they designed it, they built it, right? But what, for some reason, we set all logic and reasoning aside and, and people say, no, all of this just happened by chance. It's not logical. There, there has to be intelligence behind creation. And God is that intelligence. Now you say, well, why do people struggle with this? I go back to Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. They don't want to hear it. La, 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 la. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear anything about God. Don't use your Bible. Just set it aside. No. Why? For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For the invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. My point here is that science, excuse me, that creation screams the existence of God. Creation screams the existence of God. In fact, just this morning, Individual sent this not knowing what we were preaching. Pastor Doug got it and then sent it to me. Take a look at this. Hey, look, the artist signed his name. <laughs> Creation screams the existence of God. And once you accept the fact that God exists, it's not a leap to understand that he created and a creation, creation is the evidence that points to his existence. Here's another testimony that establishes the existence of God, and that's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, Hebrews chapter 1. You can turn there if you'd like. Verses 1 to 3. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. You have that in the scriptures. You have the Old Testament and so on. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heirs of all things, through whom also he created the world, through Jesus. He, speaking of Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, the nature of God. And he upholds the universe by his word and his power. And after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty of, on high. God's revealed himself in at least three ways. Through his creation, you can see the glory of God. Through his word, the written word, and then through the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ. Spoken of in John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. In the beginning was the capital W word, and the word was with God, and the Word was God. He's talking about Jesus. How do we know? He goes on to say, He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Look down at verse 14, John 1, 14. John is writing, he was a witness to Jesus and who he was and what he did. And he says, and the capital W Word became flesh. And dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. The glory as of the only son from the father. Full of grace and truth. He saw Jesus. And he was the representation. The expression. The revelation of God. To you and me. Colossians 2.9 says. For in him. Speaking of Jesus. The whole fullness of deity. Dwells bodily. Isn't that something? It establishes the fact that Jesus is God, and he's a revelation of God in the fact that he exists. John 10, 30, Jesus says, I and the Father of one, are one. So Jesus is evidence that God exists. Jesus is evidence that God exists. He is the one God who became man. He was perfect. He was sinless. He was the one who could provide 
the single sufficient sacrifice for your sin and mine. We've all sinned, right? We fall short of the glory of God. But Jesus, he died, he was buried, and he rose again to pay for that sin debt that you could never pay. And I'll tell you, it's exciting to think that God, this holy God, was willing to sacrifice his son, God the Son, to provide salvation for you. If you would just believe. Again, it's a matter of faith to believe that he did that for you. And when you believe and you receive that gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, you have eternal life. You are reconciled with God. Powerful truths that gives hope for life. It, so much of this, people are just, they're just out there with their own ideas and they're just trying to figure out life. My friend, God has it all figured out and it's found here in his word. It's established. And when you believe that, there's stability. He who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice are like the wise man who built his house upon the rock. And when the winds of life and the storms blow in your life, you can stand firm because you have that firm foundation on God, his word, the Lord Jesus Christ. So the result of that, if you believe that, and this is the final testimony, is a changed life. It's a changed life. Second Corinthians 5.17 says, if, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And because of that, Paul says, therefore I do not be ashamed. I am, therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about the Lord, uh, about our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but share in sufferings for the gospel by the power of God who saved us and called us by a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. Who can deny the power of a changed life? I hope you love testimonies. To hear about people who, 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 uh, who were dead in their trespasses and sins and because of Jesus were made alive. And I've asked one of our, our men, one of our deacons, if he'll come and give you his testimony about how he came to Jesus. And uh, so, Tim, if you'll come up here now and share with us how you came to Christ. Again, my name is Tim McDaniel. I was raised in this church. In fact, my mom was going to the old church on Cherry Street when I was born. So I have one faint memory of the Cherry Street Baptist Church before growing up here. Uh, so mom brought me to church every Sunday. And sometime in first grade, there was a, a fall evangelistic campaign. And so we would come in the evenings and listen to that. And... On the way home one evening uh, from that campaign, my mom was asking me, well, you know, are you going to go to heaven? And, and uh, so I don't know. And so she, she went through the, the gospel with me, and I decided that night that, that I wanted that for my life, that I knew that I was a sinner and that I needed to change. So the next night, uh, back at the, the campaign, then I came forward, and Pastor Peters met with me at that time. And the next summer then, uh, I was baptized, so grew up here in the church through grade school, and then uh, when I was in seventh grade, Pastor Doug was here by that time, so I grew up under Pastor Doug's ministry uh, the whole time, went away to college, so I was, I was growing in my faith all through those years, um, was active in college, I, I attended the Baptist Student Union uh, when I went to Eastern Kentucky. Then I, when I went to Indiana University, I also joined the Baptist Student Union there. So I continued uh, being involved in churches, being active in them, and growing through the time. Kind of interesting with today's lesson here. Um, while I was at IU, I was getting uh, a double master's degree. And one of them, I always told everybody, it was ecology. But the full name of the degree was ecology and evolutionary biology. So I got a lot of training on that. And it was, what's particularly interesting is one of my professors... He's the one that challenged me the most because he had a class where we were going back kind of the starting points, the philosophy. So that was the first time I'd ever read anything about creation science. Uh, so I wrote a paper on it, 
I, I remember the words were uh, woefully inadequate for a graduate student because I put forward that I believe the creation amount uh, in there. So uh, that, that was kind of a scary thing since he was on my master's committee. <laughs> but I got through that. And, and I've grown more and more in my belief through science and the Bible after that class. So it really was a, a major point for me in my growth. Um, like I said, continuing to study the word throughout. At one point, um, after we got married, Susan and I took a, a program through Moody Bible Institute. So we did a 30-hour at-home training program. And uh, it, it took us through much like a, a Bible curriculum would. So we've been active here in the church. Uh, I've, I've been involved in missions here. Uh, I was in a deacon once before. Uh, and just a variety of roles teaching, adult Sunday school class and such, teens and, and the little ones. Uh, so I continue to serve and to work. Uh, I don't work for my salvation. Uh, I work because of my salvation. So um, my favorite verse is from Ephesians. Uh, and a lot of people read 2, 8, and 9. I always add verse 10 with it. For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from work, so that no one can boast. For we are his creation, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time so that we should walk in them. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Tim. Appreciate that. And regardless to whether you came to the Lord uh, early in life, as Tim did, or later in life, it's a work of God. And, uh, and surrendering to him and belief in him. Who can deny the evidence of a changed life? One who walks faithfully with the Lord. In our flesh, we want to walk our own way. But through Jesus, there's salvation and there's, there's growth in him. You think of the apostle Paul, who was Saul, and how he surrendered to Jesus and he came to the Lord. So the fact of the matter is God exists and you are accountable to him. God exists. You're accountable to him. And he deserves your worship. You respond in repentance and faith. You say, you know what? It's not about me. Life is not about me. I've tried living my own way, and that's not working out. I don't care what other way you're living apart from God. It's not going to work out. But as you turn to the Lord in repentance and faith, believing you have a foundation of truth that God exists. He's revealed himself in his word, the living word, the written word. He's revealed himself in creation. We live in light of these truths. We're accountable to him. And that should then cause us to respond in praise. Psalm 95, verse 6 says, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Do not harden your heart. We want to help you come to Jesus. If you have questions about what we've been talking about here and how we can come to these conclusions, we want to help you with that. Don't, don't just dismiss it or just hope you get it figured out. If, if we can help you, we want to help you. That, that's why we're here. It could be tragic to let that, that go and not deal with that in your own heart. So I'll be, I'll be available after the service. Please don't hesitate to, to talk with us. Father, thank you for your word. Your word is truth. And thank you that we can, we can uh, believe you and trust you uh, with all of these things. And... Uh, and know that, that we can have confidence. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's a power of God unto salvation for those who believe. He says, I know whom I believe and am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Thank you that we can have confidence in these truths. And I pray that if there's anyone that does not know you, that they would come to you this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you all please stand with us and sing?
evidences that you've put all around us, Lord. Creation does scream that you are a creator, God, and that you've placed this earth here. And for us, so we can know you. God, I thank you for not just leaving it at creation, but as we've lost our way, coming down to redeem us, to show us once again that you are God and that you love and call us to be yours. I pray that as we look at the evidences around us, that more importantly, as we dive into your word and we seek after you, as James puts it, as we draw near to God and he will draw near to you, I pray that that be our action, that we look around, that we draw near to you, and that out of a thankful and humble heart, we turn to you for salvation and rely upon you for your grace and joy and peace in our lives. But that doesn't stop there, that we leave this building, we leave our homes and we share that with others and point others to you as well. In your name we pray. Amen.
and have a we have a brief members meeting. If you please be seated once again, just real quick. Just have uh, 